And then just one morning I made the switch. I was like, I'm not going to listen to anyone else anymore. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they doubt. I need to put 100% in focusing on my own self doubts, figuring out my own mental strength, power, getting my own mental capacity aligned with like where I wanted to be in five years. But anyone who was doubting me, I kind of cut them out of my life. Things started becoming more positive. I started figuring out my own thoughts a little more. Like, like once you focus on just your own thoughts and your own self doubt, you realize that your own self doubt means way more than any doubt that anyone else gives you. Mm -hmm. And that deserves attention. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 107 of the Andrew Deitch Podcast. Thanks for checking out the show. Um, if you don't know already, this show is all about having meaningful conversations with some of the most fascinating and amazing people that I know. We hang out here in my studio and we have awesome conversations. And if you're listening to the audio only version, I just want to let you know that we do have a video version now, which is pretty dope. Um, if you want to watch me, um, <laughs> but if you are watching the video version and you don't want to stick around for the whole time, you just want to maybe do some more important things. You can pick back up on the audio version. Um, we are on Spotify, Google play. Um, you know, it, it makes a lot more sense to multitask while you're listening to the podcast, you know, like cooking, cleaning, working out, all that kind of stuff. So definitely just know that if you're watching the video, you can go and listen to the audio only version. And just also know that this podcast is always going to be audio focused. The video is just another added element to, to make it more fun. But um, anyways, I'm pretty excited about this episode. So let's just jump into it. My guest today is Randall Blizzard. And Randall, he wears a lot of hats. He does a lot of stuff but he is the CEO and founder of RCR Video, which is a video production company here in Atlanta. They work for a bunch of really huge brands here. And he's also the host of The Late Night Startup, which is a podcast here in Atlanta focused on talking to entrepreneurs and startups and um, just really kind of getting their stories. And it's pretty similar to my podcast. I was recently a guest on that podcast. I'll let you guys know when that episode comes out. Um, but yeah, he just highlights really awesome people here in Atlanta. And I had an amazing time chopping it up with him about all kinds of stuff, including what to charge as a creator. Sometimes that's kind of a hard thing to, to figure out. Um, you know, we talked about starting his podcast. We talked about uh, video for a little bit and why both of us are not college graduates. And this is a super fun episode. So without any further ado, please welcome my friend, Randall Blizzard. All right, Randall Blizzard, what's up, man? How's it going, man? It's good. Good. It's very, very good. So, for people that don't know, I just did your show recently. Mm -hmm. The episode's not out, but like maybe by the time this. And there's like know. three more episodes that I have to put out before yours. Dude, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm behind. Yes, but yeah. So, so Randall's a podcaster, obviously. Mm -hmm. But before that, you're you're a video dude. Yeah, totally video dude. So, just to kick things off, like I like to kind of, you know. Share, share with who you are, obviously. Share with everybody who you are. I've already kind of introed you, but in your own words, what, when someone comes up to you and says, like, hey, so what do you do? What What's your go-to? That That's funny because I've been doing what I do for, like, 10 years now, 11 years, and uh, I still don't have my elevator speech <laughs> down. But in a nutshell, I, uh, I do video production. Um, my company's called RCR Video. That's my corporate company. It's corporate meaning we do a lot of corporate commercials, social media ads, things like that. Um, we have a few fairly large size clients. Um, uh, I won't name them, but they're 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 decent. They keep the bills I just, paid. I just realized I started recording in 1080p, and I don't even know why. Let me let's let me change. Over. Let's start over. Let's start over. I literally like if you oh, promise shit. to keep this part in there. I will. Though. I will. Yeah. I totally will for everybody. I I am. This is like the vulnerable part that you Indeed. have to you have to keep in there. Indeed. All right, we're back. We're recording in 4K now. 4K. <laughs> yeah, ultra resolution see yeah. all of them pores well, so do you think that when people started recording in 4k it was like like the level of plastic surgeries increased like when people Ooh. started seeing higher quality footage probably more people were like man i really need plastic surgery now. probably like honestly especially with people that are on TV a lot and stuff. Yeah. Totally makes sense. So for people listening to the audio version, they're like, what just happened? But yeah, so if you don't know, the video, the podcast is now on video. It's been on video for the past few episodes. Also, thanks to Randall, he actually sold me the camera that we're using. I did, I did. But but yeah, so for people that are listening that don't really know the like 4K versus 1080p thing, basically it's like with 4K, mm. 
it's basically like four times the resolution of your standard high definition image. Mm -hmm. Like, cause even what, 10 years ago, 1080p high definition, like that was the king, right? Yeah, that was, that was like the new thing. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, and everyone had, there, cause the main thing is you can shoot in whatever resolution you want, but whatever, you know, wherever people are gonna consume the video, you know, most of the time people aren't even consuming an image on a resolution high enough to really take advantage of the full of the full potential of totally. the video itself. So it's like TVs got better, phone screens got better. So now we can deliver these high high resolution yep. images and actually take advantage of it. But yeah, and now everybody wants to have plastic surgery mm -hmm. for that. <laughs> but but, uh, but that's also I think social media too. You know, like everyone kind of wants they they. They look at like Kardashian type people. They think they look good, and everyone wants the no a little nose job, yeah. a little, little little thing, little thing. And everyone just ends up looking the same. They all look the same. Because yeah. all the girls that end up like not not to be super stereotypical, but like a lot of people that end up getting st uh, plastic surgery, like women, they all kind of like. I feel like they all hang out together. Mm -hmm. Like they're all friends with each other. All the plastic surgery chicks, and yep. then you look at like four chicks, and you're like. They are all the same person, just with different hair colors. Oh, it's like they all went to the same doctor, for sure. Literally. And like, their noses are all the same shape. Their lips yeah. are all a little bit inflated. They share the same doctor. 100%. Yeah, for sure. That's for funny. For sure. Referrals, baby. Referrals, that's Makes right. Makes the world that go around. mouth marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's awesome. Well, um, so, Randall, so I kind of want to go back a little bit on your yeah. backstory, because, you know, that's super interesting, because I think video is just super hot nowadays. Like, you... You're scrolling through Facebook, you're through, scrolling through Instagram, you're gonna end up seeing some video content yeah. and stop on it. And there's all different types. You know, there's cell phone videos, that's what's made it so accessible to everybody. Um, you know, obviously, and then there's people like you that are shooting on really expensive cameras, creating um, high quality production yeah. for like big companies. So, like, how did you get started in that world? Man, so I've been holding the camera since I was like eight years old. Mm. So, um, I remember going to my dad's closet and he had this like really old school camera recorded on the big tapes and stuff. And uh, me and my cousin and my brother, we would all go out nights and weekends outside of school and, and just film. And uh, it wasn't until I got, I think it was about ninth grade that I was like, this is what I want to do. And um, as I went through high school, uh, my parents, specifically my mom, was like, you need to go talk to the counselor because you need to get your college application in. I was like, I know what I want to do. I I want to be a filmmaker. I want to make videos and stuff. And uh, that was about the end of that conversation. She never, I'm super grateful for her because she never like was like, well, you have to go. If you mm. don't go, you're a failure in my eyes. No, none of that somewhat stereotypical, you know, parents these days, it's like, if you don't go to college, you're letting your parents down. And that's mm -hmm. a huge pressure on kids. My mom was like, all right, you know what you want to do? And she had seen that I had been pursuing it um, up until that point. So it was like, it's almost like she knew that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. So I didn't go that to college. That makes sense. Didn't go to college for it, didn't go to school for it. I just, I shot with the very first high-end digital camera, the Red One, um, as I was going into 10th grade. A guy wow. hired me. Uh, he literally sold his farm, made I think 230 something thousand dollars off of selling his farm in Rome, Georgia, or near Rome. And uh, he hired me um, to shoot his film. and. It's how I met that guy was we did like a feature film a year before that during the summer that was all about it was it was essentially a hallmark love story um, and I mean this was before I was in 10th grade uh, and we hired this guy to like he had like one line in this library that we were shooting in and ever since then he just like I don't know if he thought I was older than what I was or I had a receding hairline at a very young age so like I always looked older um, <laughs> One of the positives of having a receding hairline. Dude, it took me so long to like fucking embrace it. Can I cuss? Sorry. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, you can cuss. It, it took me. You so can fucking cuss yeah, as much as you fucking good, want, good. Randall. Now I feel like <laughs> now I feel at home. I dropped it, but it, it took me so long to embrace that, man. It wasn't until I actually graduated high school that um, my girlfriend, now wife, uh, was like. Uh, we're gonna shave your head, and she just like shaved it. And even then, I was like, all right, well, if we're gonna shave my head. You need to show. You need to like put the razors in front of your cell phone. Like video it. We're gonna put it on YouTube because YouTube was like just becoming a thing, yeah. right? I was like, we're gonna put it on YouTube. It's gonna go viral. Like you shaved my head without me knowing. And like, it's so video has just always been in my mind. Um, but so this guy sold his farm, hired me to shoot his film, and he had enough money to get the highest end new digital camera, which was the Red One. That was the very first 
how much how much camera. did that camera cost at the time uh it was probably between 50 and seventy thousand. but mm. do, i mean don't quote me on that yeah yeah um it was but, an expensive but, but a significant amount of money and even then. more for for back then like yeah. you know just with inflation alone yeah like, that's that's not that's not cheap for yeah. sure so i got you know my head got a little big because i was like this guy's paying me x amount of dollars to shoot a film on the newest camera out that yeah. that everyone in the in the filmmaking industry was just starting to use for sure. So, uh, ever since then, it's just it's kind of what I've done. Like I, that's I, awesome. It's, I just started taking it serious and have wanted to just be the creative filmmaker. Then I was like, all right, I need to learn business. So I started reading more business books and like listening to business podcasts and going to business seminars and and all that stuff to figure out the business side of it. Um, not so concerned about the creative. So mm, um, that makes sense. Yeah, which that leads into like my podcast. I'm yeah, like, we'll yeah, get yeah, into yeah. That later. So your podcast is called um, the late night, the startup late night show. startup. Yep. And initially, it was you. You kind of had like a, a different concept for it initially, and yeah. then it kind of evolved into what it is now. Yep. Um, what was your like initial like? How how has the show changed like from the beginning to now? Man, it's changed so much. Uh, but honestly, a lot of that change is probably for me internally Mm -hmm. um maybe you don't you'll see the changes like it started i was gonna literally drive my car to these businesses and like do a podcast setting my suv has a tailgate it's super weird yeah it it, like it's kind of cool too yeah so So like you're gonna do a pod you're gonna pull up we're gonna do a podcast on the tailgate lights three cameras excuse me we're gonna do a podcast on the tailgate and uh I did a few episodes like that <laughs> and then we started going into the businesses and doing it that way and me being a video guy and like a cinematographer and stuff i was like man we can't control the train that's right outside the door we can't control the lighting yeah uh, you know the i was trying to hide the mics i wasn't using like the procaster mics yet mm-hmm. um yeah it was just man everything about it was like i was so in my head about the technical side of things yeah that i wasn't able to like really be 100 percent present in the podcast mm. um so then Did you I, have other people like on set yeah, yeah, that yeah. were like that running? That was the thing too. I had a three-person crew. I had um, three cameras, two boom mics, lobs. Uh, it was a production. Yeah, like it was. It was a because that's what that's your world. Yeah, like exactly. you reviewed it not as like oh I'm gonna start this little podcast. You were like we're gonna make a professional podcast. Yeah. Like this is gonna be um, like the epitome of what I would want. Exactly. Well, like the the tagline of the podcast, the loose tagline is. Um, we want to interview local entrepreneurs and startups to provide content for them and value for the aspiring. Because mm-hmm. um, it's a it's a super nerve wracking thing to start your own anything, uh, especially sure. in your business. Um, so like I wanted to interview local entrepreneurs, uh, and while we interview them, I would cut like micro content pieces for them, and yeah. um, you know they would have some content, some video content out of it. So I started thinking in form of creating content which for me is a production. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it just- Content me, is a weird word right now. Isn't it, right? Yeah. Like content means so much. It's almost like the word podcast. Like it, it's almost thrown around so much that it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. Like when I think of a podcast, I tend to think of something like this. Mm-hmm. Some other people might think of like a true crime podcast or like yeah. a, um, you know, an NPR style podcast or a news podcast yeah. or like a, almost like a fictional show type of podcast. It's like, it's like, you know, oh, I have a radio show, yeah. you know? So you kind of have an idea what a radio show is, but like it could be anything. Yeah. Oh, I make music. Oh, I kind of know what, the, but are you making electronic music? Are you making music yeah. with real instruments? There's like, so many genres Are now. you singing? Yeah, like it, it's it's very, very vague. And I think that with the word content, everyone has their like idea of what content is. Mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, I, I'm a content creator. Yeah. What the fuck does that even mean? Right. Like, are you writing copy? Like, are you making, are you writing digital? Just because digital? you post you know? on social media doesn't mean you're a content creator. That's very true. Like, or maybe you are, you're just super amateur, you're not yeah. getting paid for it. Like, yeah. you're not a professional content creator. Exactly. You're creating content of some kind, but you're not like, you yeah. know, that's not what you do. It's not what you do, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And even if it is what you do, is like, my whole thing is, is your, the content you're creating for selfish reasons, like for you to get paid and make a buck, or is it is it really to put compelling content out there to mm-hmm. inspire, motivate, or question? You mm-hmm. know, so yeah, know. very very true. Um, yeah, that that's it's it's really just like a weird time right now where like everyone is trying to be like a content creator or whatever. But you've been kind of like in this world for a while. I kind of want to go back a yeah, little bit because like when you said you started making videos when you were like eight. 
There was no. Super young. Yeah, and there wasn't, I mean, this is before any type of social media. This is before the internet was big. This uh, is before, like, what, what were you shooting on? Like a VHS this is style before dial cassette tone. type yeah, thing? Yeah, it was like a VH, VHS style. I, it was, I just remember my dad's camera. It was like you put the VHS style tape in it and like, man, the sound of closing that thing. And this, this is why I'm like Very mechanical. so in love with like video and stuff too. It's like, I, I'm not the most technical video guy, but I don't know, just like everything about it just gets me going. Like the sound of that VHS closing and this, I mean, you just, re you realize, you felt like, all right, I gotta make this tape mean something. Like this, every inch of tape in this VHS has to like, has to mean something to me or like it has to be good versus now you slap like a sd card in the camera you got like five hours of footage who cares Easy. if you go three three hours of it is useless content mm -hmm. um but the last two hours it's like okay i can make something out of this mm -hmm. versus back then it was like man I, i'm gonna have to load up a whole nother tape and sort through it there's there is no clip thumbnails or anything like mm -hmm. i don't know I that's just, why i almost kind of like um like for example I kind of first started making stuff on like a little GoPro and it didn't have a screen and yeah. stuff. And like, I almost kind of liked that because I, w I couldn't ever review the footage. It was like, I just had to make sure my take was good, yeah. hope for the best and then like view it later. And that's kind of how like those types uh -huh. of cameras were. Like maybe if you were lucky, you had a cool camcorder that had like a little screen where you could review the footage, yeah. but either way, it's well, that's not how like, all film making was, you yeah. know, like the old school cameras, film cameras, they didn't have monitors. They no. didn't have waveforms built in. So you had these old school guys walking around with their light meters, like measuring the light in the room. And like they would put lights in there and then they would measure, okay, I want my key side or like the, the main light side to, you know, be whatever F stop and my shadow side to be two stops under that. And then they didn't see the image until they printed the film and saw it. And like, you have to respect that, man. Totally. Like, that's, to me, that is so, like, I would never be able to do that. It's I do more video a for a living, yeah. yeah, and I would never be able to do that. Yeah, it's totally, it's like a different animal completely, because you're also creating, you're creating a video to be viewed on in a totally different medium, a totally different purpose. Mm -hmm. Like, the only place, when those guys were making videos, the only place you could go watch them was in a theater or something. Like, yeah. you didn't have a, a thing in your home, let alone your pocket, that yeah. you could watch stuff on. Yeah. So, it's just a totally different time yeah. you know and just less video even being made yeah like just the sheer amount of actual video being shot at any given time right now is just absolutely mind-boggling yeah, it's crazy and i think there's like some stat about like in the past year we've created more information than the, all of human existence beforehand yeah. like we're just creating so much shit yeah that it's almost too much to handle yeah like it, it's very weird yeah and it's crazy for someone in my shoes because i've been doing video even as a business prior to like video being the hot thing yeah. to do or to produce and all that. So it's, and I feel like I haven't grown at a rapid pace, um, but I've grown very, very slowly. And I, I don't, I've grown debt free. Like I don't, I, all these new cameras were coming out and I was, I was like, I'm not gonna go buy an $80,000 camera and take out a $70,000 loan for it yeah, uh, and all that. Like I just, I just stayed within reason, stay within my means. So I've grown That's a little really slower, smart. but I'm able to say no. I'm able to leverage what I do own uh, against other opportunities. Um, and I think the power of saying no is probably the most important thing. Totally. Because um, even the power to say no gives me also the ability to be misunderstood. Um, because as long as I'm misunderstood, like me being um, like the owner of my company and a creator and it's all these different titles that I guess I've accumulated over the years, uh, being misunderstood is a daily thing, like mm -hmm. especially in business. I don't know how many like business people you have listening, but yeah. in business, man, like I'm misunderstood on almost every single one of my decisions that I make by somebody. And then there's other people that are like, okay, it makes sense. Uh, but there's been so many times where it's like a completely misunderstanding. I just noticed a desk. I love the desk. Sorry. I'm it's pretty awesome. ADD here. Um, <laughs> it's a like exposed edge desk. It's pretty badass. I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. Anyway, so so uh, I think being being misunderstood is just a powerful thing. And I, there's a quote that Steve Jobs said. I forget exactly what it mm -hmm. what the quote was, but it was along the lines of being. You don't have it memorized by heart. I, I don't, man. Damn I'm it, sorry. Man. I, I'm not. I'm just that kidding. Guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, as much as I read and listened to like audio 
I mean, video podcasts and like watch video podcasts and listen to audio podcasts about business. It's like I'm not the guy to like sit there and write notes and like remember, remember. Like, eventually, too. you got to start acting and exactly. executing. Um, but anyway, I just all that to say, I feel like video was what I was doing, and then over time, I wait. Realized, what was the Steve Jobs quote? I didn't. I don't remember. Oh, okay, okay. I, which I, my phone's here. I could look it up. I don't <laughs> want to spend the time doing that. But it was about being. It was a quote because you know Steve Jobs is known to be like the asshole and super misunderstood. Uh, and it was about, it was just about the ability and the freedom of being misunderstood. Mm-hmm. And when you're a CEO or a business owner or anything like that, you have to accept that. And it took me a while to do totally. that. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I can relate hardcore with the being misunderstood thing because um, I think my whole, I guess you could call it my whole career, I've it's always been just predicated on me trying different shit, like yeah. just me you know, I'm gonna start a podcast. I was definitely misunderstood by a lot of people at yeah. first, but now it, it's funny because once once you have those initial moments, it's like the crazy ones, you know, you're like the weird one for doing this weird thing, but yeah. then it ends up working. And then people are just sitting back wondering how it worked or why you even decided yeah. to do it in the first place. People are always like, so what inspired you to make a podcast? I'm like, I don't know, I was crazy enough to think I could do it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I had, a, I had a reason, but it's like, what gives you even the, what gives you the, <laughs> balls to think that you can even do this or whatever same thing why, with why the, do you think people are going to listen to you and yeah, like, yeah yeah exactly and all those self-doubts and i have those for myself like you know imposter syndrome i get that all the time where i think why does anyone listen to this show yeah. or why you know why should anyone you know but um yeah i think it's anyone who's a little, just crazy enough to to, to go for it yeah. you know that's kind of what gives it the credibility in the first place you know and i think the self-doubt thing is interesting because that goes right along with being misunderstood but i was at an interesting place like this time last year Mm because i was partners not like legal partners but like partners with some other people in business and all that and um it just the relationship started going south and like it was all from misunderstandings and all and i got to a point and i realized this was a weakness of mine to where i would spend so much time thinking about the doubts that other people were putting on me um like why do people want to listen to you or like why do you think your idea is good or how how do you think it's gonna like all those doubts that other people were placing on me i was focusing so much time on like proving against them that Mm -hmm. it would work and then one day i just woke up and i was like i really listened to my own brain and which is where all the self-doubt came in Mm -hmm. so i was like i was like damn i'm listening to all these other people that don't really matter when it comes to laying my head down at night i'm listening to your paycheck exactly i'm listening to all of them doubt me And on top of that, I have all this self-doubt in my own head, but listening to the other people doubt me was like probably 80% of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then only 20% of focusing on my self-doubt and correcting my own self-doubt. And then just one morning I made the switch. I was like, I'm not going to listen to anyone else anymore. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they doubt. I need to put 100% in focusing on my own self-doubts, figuring out my own mental strength, power, but getting my own mental capacity aligned with like where I wanted to be in five years and all that and only focusing on like what my own self was telling me Mm -hmm. and I just completely started ignoring everybody else who would doubt me that's awesome and it was kind of like a byproduct of that is it started cutting out negativity yeah so the only people that I would listen to around me they were for the most part positive because I was keeping them around me Mm -hmm. um but anyone who was doubting me I kind of cut them out of my life Mm -hmm. uh things started becoming more positive I started figuring out my own thoughts a little more like why I was having these thoughts. Um, and all of that just led to like me rearranging how I was doing the podcast. It led to me cutting out certain people in my business that were a negative force. And mm-hmm. now like my business is doing pretty good right now. So yeah. man, it's just crazy. Like once you focus on just your own thoughts and like your own self doubt, you realize that your own self doubt means way more than any doubt that anyone else gives you. Mm-hmm. And that n- deserves attention. For sure. And, and put, Put attention on your own self-doubt versus the doubt that other people are throwing yeah. at you. Yeah. Did you ever like you? You kind of said it in the beginning. You're saying in like tenth grade, you got asked to go on this set with like the most expensive camera at the time or the best newest camera. Fake it at till the you time. make it, baby. <laughs> yeah, and it's fake until you make it. You know, yeah. but I'm sure that was a big confidence booster. You kind of mentioned that, like just being on that set and giving you kind of a big head. Like, so I'm I'm working with some big cats right now. Like, and I'm so just this little I guy. Got, I got the confidence boost and the big head 
when I got asked to do it and got hired to do it. And then day one on set, it was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So like yeah. that confidence boost wasn't while we were doing the production. It was just like at the beginning, the two months prior to me getting hired, leading up to the first day of production. And then when you st- when I stepped on that set, I was like, I'm in way over my head. I have no idea. But yeah. and then I had to have kind of this false bravado to like, like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, put that put that light there. Like I didn't know anything. I didn't yeah. know like what a what a what a 250 diffusion was or what an opal diff was or like what like just technical terms like yeah i didn't know what over under when wrapping uh, a chord was like all these things that these people just knew that are so basic so absolute basic and i'm like i don't even know the basic shit and these people are yeah. supposed to be answering to me but wow. uh what yeah. was your like role as you got hired to that dp i was a director of photography wow so i, I was i was shooting the film and then obviously uh, like the film so we shot during the summertime and then some reshoots happening while i was in school so there was like uh, another guy that had to come in if I was in school cause, but but I never said I never said that I was in school though I was always like oh shoot sorry I'm booked on something else it, it wasn't like hey I'm going <laughs> to my 10th grade English class next that's Tuesday hilarious. which is why I can't be there that's so awesome I love that I love that fake it till you make fake it fake it till you make it yeah, yeah. I really I, I love that idea of kind of not lying but like giving a not a I don't know it's not dishonest because you were booked on something else. You did have to go to another class. Yeah. But you didn't have to say what that thing was. Like, I, I'm a big fan of, like, uh, giving people slightly a little bit of an illusion of what's going on. Like, yeah. even with this studio, like, you wouldn't imagine, like, this is where it is. Yeah. But, like, this is where it is. Well, the, like, whole, the whole fake it to the make it statement is bullshit if it's a, if it's a, a plan to just to to constantly get ahead or like to get more money or to like if you're lying about it then that's fine the only way fake it till you make it works and why it worked for me is because i envision make it i knew where i wanted to be i knew the knowledge that i wanted to have like even being on set when i like my lighting guy the gaffer i would see like all of his just immense knowledge about lighting and all that i'm like damn that's where that's my make it. Like I want to know what he knows. Yeah. And I, so, so I had like my what m- making it meant to me, and then I was like, all right, I'm gonna make sure every decision that I make or everything that I say or how I display myself I- into the public eye um, is all going to lead to how to to me making it. It wasn't like I'm gonna fake it till I make it, but you know but take never to make, make it out of that it's yeah. just fake it fake it fake it and then you become just a deceiving deceitful lying piece of shit right? yeah not like a pyramid scheme where it all you know trickles in yeah. and then you dump or something yeah. like it you, you eventually were going to get to the point where you were an expert in your field yeah and you have to have that vision or else you're just faking it yeah there is totally no makes there sense. is no journey to making it faking it fake it till you make it is the journey to making it right yeah um That's yeah if you if you're just faking it with no end goal, with no vision or anything like that, then you're just, you're, you're scam. You're a scam. You're yeah. 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 That, that would almost be like, if you're like a video production company, you get, you get someone to sign on as a client and you don't have the right stuff and then you never even give them like an end result or something yeah. and you just take all their money. But yeah. you're, you're actually making stuff. You're delivering on your promises. Yeah. Well, and just like, you know, for instance, uh, fake it till you make it. When I first started, started out like one of the first corporate company hired us to do a video, I wasn't way over my over my head. I was like, this is gonna require higher end cameras than we had at the time. This is gonna require twelve person crew, and you know the budget is way more than I've ever managed logistically, and all that. Um, and you know, if they say, you know, do you have the capacity to handle this? Of course, I'm gonna say yes, even though I knew I don't have the capacity right now. But I know I can make twenty three phone calls as soon as I get out of this meeting. I know I can reach out to other people, uh, like my dad, for instance, because we had to like construct this set. And I was like, he's not like a set designer, but he's handy as Mm -hmm. fuck. He can like build anything, build any room. And I was like, I can reach out to him, bring him in. So it wasn't, I didn't say, oh yeah, we have the capacity to lie to them. It was like, I know that I can- I can get it done. Get it done. And deliver the product. And deliver it. Yeah, that makes total sense. Because I've been in similar situations recently. I, I've kind of mentioned it on the podcast before and I've told you just from doing this podcast has led to like so many opportunities of totally. people like, yo, what you're doing with your show, can you do that for me? Yeah. And I'm like, 
I mean, realistically, yeah. yeah. It's more just like time commitment stuff. It's like, yeah. do I have the operations to do it? And that's why I'm kind of growing right now, which is really exciting. Um, but when you were first building out like a team and stuff like that, like, cause you know, it, where you're at now, you're, you're, it definitely didn't start off like that with all the cameras and equipment and people mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So like, take me back to kind of when you first started doing your own gigs and stuff like that. Cause obviously you were probably working for other people for a while. Like you said, you were like DP for this film. Yeah. When did you kind of start going off into your own like business? Cause you said you started looking into the business mm-hmm. side of things. What was that like? Well, it's still a, it's still a combination. Like I still show up mm-hmm. and freelance DP for you know, certain clients and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, the good thing is those clients know that I have a whole company. Um, so for instance, like, uh, I think it was last Thursday, I got the call, a client that I was just showing up to just shoot for and hand off the footage uh, after years of doing that, but constantly somewhat reminding them, not like so on the nose or in their face, but constantly reminding them in casual conversation, like, yeah, we have the capacity to do full video, script a, script a uh, screen and, and finished edits and all that. Uh, so last Thursday they called us like, hey, we need this edit done uh, by January 1st. Can you can you get it done? We're, we're too bogged down. And I was like, well, of course we can get it done. And they, but they would have never even called me if I wasn't constantly reminding them or, or maintaining the relationship, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I guess to answer your question, I still, I definitely do our own project way more. That's like 98% of what I do, but there's still those like 2% to mm-hmm. where I'll show up just to shoot, hand over the footage. But the beautiful, beautiful thing about that is, I'm renting all of my gear to them. I'm taking my my lighting and grip truck. Um, I know we're throwing around terms that people probably don't yeah. know, but um, but it's taking like all of my equipment to these shoots. So so to answer your question, when it started becoming like a business, was when I started thinking okay, I don't need this fancy camera that produces the most high quality image that they're using to shoot The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings on and all that, um, because that's not what I'm using to shoot the projects that I'm getting hired with. So I kind of started purposely forgetting about the art and like creative side of it, Mm -hmm. even though that's tough for a creative to do. Mm -hmm. I started thinking things just in business. Like if I buy this camera, the people that are hiring me and paying me, are they going to use it? Or are they going to be like, oh, no, that's a little too high end for what we need. We don't need that high scale camera. So I went, you know, 10 steps down, mm-hmm. bought Canon C300 Mark IIs, which are back then we had just C300s. But still, we've, a ni- still a really nice we've camera. Since upgrade. Still a really nice camera. I mean, it was a $17,000 camera when we bought it, but I was thinking about buying the $70,000 camera um, that can shoot 6K and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And, um, yeah, so it started becoming a business when I started thinking about how, when I get paid, how much of that money is going in funneling through me to my business account. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it just, yeah, I, I, I literally, it's a tough conversation because I, I consider myself a creative a filmmaker and all that. And there's so many people around me in my industry that say, well, I only want to do cinematic work um, Mm -hmm. or I don't don't even want to do like documentary film style work and I'm like fuck you like these (laughs) these people these corporations are willing to pay you so many so much money Mm -hmm. just to show up and shoot something like this two talking heads and as long as you light it well and shoot it well and you produce good quality they're gonna pay you crazy amounts of money to do it and it's the easiest work ever. And I don't do it because I because I think it's easy. I do it because I, I truly love it. I love mm-hmm. business and all these corporations that I'm shooting videos for. Usually what we're shooting is business oriented, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm getting crazy amounts of business knowledge by showing up to these corporations. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, things just started making, I know I'm, I'm rambling, but things just started no, no, making- No, 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 I like it. Things started making sense when I started forgetting about like the fantasy. Mm-hmm. Of like, I'm a filmmaker. Romanticism yeah, of it all. Yeah, I'm a creator. I'm a, I'm a creative filmmaker. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Like, yeah, I am that. But I also have to make a living. I also have people and office rent and all the stuff that I got to take. And care turning of. down, like you said, like these corporations are willing to pay just stupid amounts of money. Like yeah. turning that down is almost kind of like, 
you know, if you're, if you're if you're a starving artist, like you know, for your family to know that you're turning down these jobs, or not yeah. even turning down, but just not even pursuing these jobs that could be paying out the wazoo is almost kind of like a slap in their face, almost, you know. And and it's an issue with the filmmaking community, our video community, getting oversaturated. Because mm -hmm. like I said, I started doing it before video was like the thing that everyone wanted to do, and before yeah. Atlanta became the filmmaking mecca of the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was doing video way before that, and uh, everyone nowadays, so, so I know this girl, she just spent $80,000 on new gear, on new equipment. It wasn't her wow. money, she got an investor. Yeah. Um, and uh, video Is she like a video production company or is it just her? They like, started a video production okay, gotcha. company. But, so the video production company doesn't want, she, I was having a conversation with her, and it's kind of who I was talking about. She was like, oh, I, we only want to do cinematic stuff, I don't want to do talking head interviews and all that. I'm like, you just spent $80,000 on gear and you can go show up and do one interview and if you take all of your gear with you, bill eight to $10,000 for that day, not even including editing, and, and make that money back. And then when you make that money back, if you want to do films that you wanna do to, and not have to answer anybody else, well then you're stockpiling cash to be able to do your own films. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I was like, I'm, I'm, I wanna do films the way that I, I don't work on films anymore. Like everyone's like, Oh, Pinewood Studios is where is like where I grew up, south of Atlanta. And th are you working on big movies because you're in Atlanta? Like I have family in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and stuff. And they're asking all these questions. I'm like, no, I don't work on any major film because I want control of what I do. I want creative say. I want to have the in in say about how it's created. I could care less to show up and be a, a day laborer or, or a technician on these big motion yeah. pictures. Some people it's, get off on that though, like, and, and some people like being a part of something they big do. like that. Well, you know, like, I'm not I, downing yeah, that. No, 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 at not all. at all. Like, you know, it, it is cool to say like you worked on the Avengers it's or awesome. something. Like that's badass. Awesome. But at the end of the day, you know, you, it's not for me. Yeah, it's not totally for me at all. Sense. And like, me so, this, so this this girl, I was like, you need to do these talking head interview projects. Like, I get where you're coming from that it takes the creative out of it. But see, it all leads back to your own your own mindset. It's like I'm doing these talking head interviews, and I it would be so easy for me to be like, oh god, 45 minute interview again. This is boring. Whatever. Here's the footage, you know, and just half ass it and all that stuff. But I have made the decision to listen to the producer that's asking the questions. I've made the decision to try out new team members uh, on these shoots. I can bring in someone I've never worked with before and you know, put them through the ringer and see if there's someone I want to use for like my passion project. There's just so much benefit behind mm -hmm. doing it. So to say, oh, I don't want to do that because I'm a, I just want to do cinematic work. You're fancying yourself way too much. You're giving yourself way too much credit because you haven't done shit yet. Mm. And and to not even show up and be willing to try it or do the work, you're, you're, you're being fake. Like it's not real. That's not, that's not, then you're not going to survive in business because I'm sorry, in business, you have to eat shit. Non fucking mm -hmm. stop. Like in 2019, I told my business partner, I said, in 2019, we just bought a red camera. We, mm -hmm. again, we had the red one. We bought Wh it. Which one did ago. you get again? We got the uh, 8K Helium. So it's the, it's the, the newest one. I mean, it mm -hmm. shoots 8K footage. But the only one above it is the Vista Vision Monstro camera, which that camera is just insane are these i mean because because i've also heard from friends that like are that have worked that on like some movies and stuff they were saying like a lot of times people are using like re cameras to shoot yeah. films these days yeah. or what's the difference between like an re camera versus like a red camera so red was the first digital camera right so like that recorded on like digital media um Airy or Ari, however you want to say it, has, yeah. been, has been around for years. You know, they're they're like the OG. They're never going anywhere. Their color science and their camera is unbelievable. The way the way that it reads highlights and shadows is unbelievable. And Red, as good as they are, still have not figured that out. Hmm. But Red offers usually higher resolution, more frame rate options. It's available to more people like that are at my level. Um, versus Airy is they have those cameras now. But, you know, five years ago, four, well, I don't know, five to 10 years ago, uh, it was like, you weren't working with an Aerie camera unless you were on one of these big Marvel <laughs> movies because yeah. they didn't, they weren't available to the regular, you know, professional consumer. Yeah, yeah. But uh, they're both, like both cameras are, are fantastic. Yeah, I, I was just curious about that. Cause like, I've never worked with either one yeah. to be honest, but I always just hear people talking about red cameras. Cause it's like, 
it's just like so badass. It seems like every, especially in like the tech world and like YouTube kind of tech reviewer yeah. kind of world, it seems like everyone's using like red cameras and mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm, I've always just been super fascinated by that stuff. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I like the look of an Aerie camera better, but red to me is more versatile mm -hmm. um, and it's it's easier to get my hands on. I mean, Would you say it's kind of the difference between like, like, cause I know for example, right now in the like prosumer world of like the camera that I'm using GH5, like versus like the Sony cameras versus like Canon cameras in that price range, like a lot of people would say like, well, Canon's cameras have like the best color science for that price range, but you don't have the same frame rate options and resolution options, stuff like that. It's like yeah. kind of apples to apples a little bit. Yeah, I, I would think so. Cause I mean, it's all personal preference, right? Yeah. I think that Canon has outside of like the DSLR, it's been forever since I've shot on like a DSLR, but as far as the Canon cinema cameras, like the C300 Mark II that we have, the the way that it reads color and its color science and the way it reads skin tones is so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but Sony, who I don't like the image as much, has better frame rate options. The ergonomics are a little better. So it's kind of like that with Aerie and Red. Aerie mm -hmm. has like the beautiful image and like like whatever you point that camera at, it's like it's gonna look amazing. Like it's cinematic. Just such a gorgeous image. Versus red though is a little more. You know, it's easier to get your hands on. The frame rates are a little better. The ergonomics. I don't know. It's just modular. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's a it's a pretty badass camera. Yeah. Some people would probably like. I don't know what the fuck these people I are know, talking exactly. about. Exactly. But honestly, like, I like get a little bit nerdy sometimes. Okay, so let's let's go back though. So you you just got this new red camera. Yep. Um, and you've been shooting on like Canon uh, C three hundred. Yeah. You said pretty well, much. So I I, I own the Canon C three hundred Mark twos, Canon C two hundred, um, several other cameras. Yeah, yeah. A smaller. So scale before than that. you had all these badass cameras though, like when you kind of like. If, so for somebody today that wants to, you know, they want to get into video stuff, they, maybe they've been making some, you know, little things on their own, maybe they're just getting into video. I mean, I'm sure people ask you this all the time, like, what, sh what starter camera should I get, blah, blah, blah. I hate this and, question. Yeah, and, it, and I'm not going to ask it, because yeah. honestly, like, there's so many other YouTube I videos. Just don't know. Yeah, there's, there's literally so many YouTube videos and creators and stuff out there that are making content for this type of entry level person that's wanting to get into video like you know peter mckinnon has a lot of really good videos um like you know even just like tech reviewers and stuff they're always reviewing cameras sarah dici she makes really good videos about this kind yeah. of stuff and there's like dslr video shooter i think is one channel or yeah i've seen that like one that. too He's, he does a lot of that type yeah. of stuff but on the flip side of that let's not talk about gear as much let's talk about like the getting paid side of things because there's a lot of people out there that like probably kind of know their way around a camera maybe they can edit a little bit but they've never taken on like a client or they've never like made money for yeah. a video and that's the other thing is like how much do i charge because i know you've we've talked about this a little bit like there are these guys out there that are like you know offering you know a hundred dollars for a video shoot and it's just like dude you're, you're devaluing yourself and you're also devaluing the market and you're giving clients and and the the market a misunderstanding of what mm -hmm. you know what to expect like what what kind of advice do you have for those people and what do you- Too much what, advice. Yeah. So so <laughs> to address kind of the latter of that, that statement, um, these people that are devaluing, the, mm -hmm. like I have some empathy, like there's there's people out there that are just, don't know what they're doing, so they charge a hundred bucks, they're trying to make a quick buck, like whatever. They use all stock footage, stock uh, effects and all that. Like they're not creating anything themselves. They're literally downloading shit, changing the words and giving it to you. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some people that are charging a hundred dollars because they went out and they bought the twelve thousand dollar camera or even the two thousand dollar camera um, when they had a hundred bucks in their bank account. So they're having, they're struggling so much, and this is where my empathy comes in. They're struggling so much that they're having to do anything to make any money to pay that shit off. And they have no, they have no, no power. Like they can't say no to they any can't job say no because they, if they want to eat, keep the roof above their head. Uh, and maintain this gear that they think they need, um, they, they have to say yes to all, all these jobs. Uh, and that's where like the downfall of like so many cameras being available is because everyone thinks they're a fucking professional videographer. Yeah. Um, but so my advice would be, if you think that you have something, if you think that you're a good video person or a creator or whatever, um, don't buy any gear. You, there's plenty of places like, Lens Pro to go, lensrentals.com, borrowlenses.com, Aperture Rent, which is actually like two seconds from your studio. Um, that if you get hired to do something, 
it's like 30 or 40 dollars to rent a really good camera and lens from these places hmm. uh, and like bill that work that into your what you're billing like 40 dollars is nothing um and there's certain ways you can sell that too to your clients if they're like oh well why aren't we paying for the gear i thought it was yours like well this is the gear that i want to use for this project because uh, of the frame rates, it's better quality, like whatever. There's plenty of things that you can say um, that that client should be willing to spend 50 extra dollars on. Mm -hmm. um, what about when you have your own gear, like you've talked about it, kind of billing in gear rental into the price of things. Like, should people be kind of, you know, a lot of people aren't thinking about this, they're like, well, I need a camera so I can start making videos, but maybe they don't, maybe they can go rent, but you gotta kind of learn on something, so you maybe having be your making camera. money. Yeah. Like, you have to, be, if you're a freelancer, to me, um, that's, also like a technician, like a camera operator, or whatever. Yeah. Um, you, if you want to do it as a business and not just, there's a difference between being a freelancer and being a business owner. Mm -hmm. Like everyone thinks like, if you're a freelancer, you're a business owner, you're not. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sorry. Yes, there's certain things and characteristics that, that correlate. However, you're not a business owner if you just consider yourself a freelancer. Um, all that to say, if you see yourself as a freelancer and business owner, then you have to start making money to then buy your own equipment um, or to build up your own website or to bring in a, a partner to help you get more clients. Like you gotta be thinking about that. First as a freelancer, it's like, all right, I'm just gonna charge my day rate and then I'll be good. Like mm -hmm. I, can, I can pay my bills with that, I can eat with that and all that stuff, mm -hmm. but there's no obligation to, to keep growing as a business. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of forgot your question. I was really kind of just saying like <laughs> build, you know, Sorry. building in all these extra costs. Cause I think a lot of people, especially even someone that's going to hire a video guy, yep. quote unquote, for oh, the very right. first Building time, you know, costs, yeah. and like they, you know, they, they don't know what you're going to charge. Yeah. You don't know what to charge. It's very vague. The market is anywhere from like, oh, how much is this video? You know, it's going to be one minute long. It could be anywhere from, you know, 50,000 bucks yeah. to a hundred bucks with these you other haven't guys. haven't networked you know? enough. Like yeah. that's, that's the thing is like, if you don't know what to charge, then why haven't you reached out to someone like me? You can mm. type in Atlanta Video Production Companies online, and I guarantee you almost 100% of those websites are going to list who's behind that company. Find them on social media, DM them like, hey, I'm just getting started out, be completely transparent. Um, do you have any advice or information on what a typical rate is for a camera operator or for a DP? Or, or, and just ask, mm -hmm. gather information, get knowledge and all that stuff. The reason you don't know what to charge is because you haven't figured it out. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's plenty of ways to figure that out besides just billing whatever and then six months later realizing like, fuck, I should have billed more, but now this client thinks that that's my rate. And that, that is a really hard one. That's the biggest issue is as soon as you don't know what to bill and you undercut everybody and bill cheap, eventually you're going to wake up, you're going to gain the knowledge, um, whether you know on purpose or accident, you, it's going to come to you, you're going to smell the coffee that this is what I should be billing. Um, and then that conversation with that client becomes very, very difficult. So my main piece of advice would be if you want to start billing and, and get experience and all that stuff, it's almost better just to do it for free than to show mm. up. Like, so for instance, my, I don't, I don't know if I should say this, but fuck it. Uh, my, my day rate right now for most of my clients is a thousand to $1,200 a day. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I first started out DPing, I went and charged less than 700, 750. And that was years ago. So the, as my rate has gone up, and that's just for me, that's not my gear or anything like that. Um, as my rate has gone up, uh, it, it makes sense because they think that it's just the years have gone by, inflation, it costs of living, expenses, like then it's a it's a it's easily understandable um, to increase my rate over you know the last five years. Yeah, totally. Uh, but if you start out and say, okay, I'm gonna bill it, it cost me $150 to come out and shoot this for you. And then six months later, you hang around, you get around a new group of friends or people that all do it. And you hear that I started charging 750. You're going to like, oh, fuck. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to charge 600 then. When you go and talk to that client, that client's going to be like, oh, okay, no, I'm going to find the next guy that will only charge 150. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it's better just to do it for free um, and build your portfolio. Uh, I mean, you still got to make money somehow to live. Yeah. But it's a difficult conversation. Yeah. It is hard because, yeah, because I think when you do it for free for a while, it is almost a little bit better than undercharging like crazy. But you got to have a pair of balls too and like be transparent with the client. You'll be like, look, I'm going to do this for free this time. 
um, because I, I rec recognize that I don't have the experience or the portfolio or anything that I can show you. So I'm gonna do it for free this time because I'm building my company, um, but I wanna help you build your company too and I know that I'm a good, good creator. Mm -hmm. um, and then as long as you predicate the relationship with that, then when you do start charging, hopefully you've produced enough, a good enough work to make them be like, okay, yeah, this is worth it. Mm -hmm. This is totally worth it. Yeah. Um, versus like, I, there's so many people that I've worked with that are freelancers or even business owners that started charging so cheap um, and now they can't get out of that. And mm -hmm. now they're starting to resent that client because that client is like, mm -hmm. we don't know, like that's more than yeah. what you were. Like it, it becomes, so and the, word, the quality hasn't really changed that much, exactly. you know, like you're making the same type of shit. Yeah, that, that's that's challenging. I, I was going to say too, like when you're kind of building up your portfolio and you're trying to like, you know, maybe do stuff for free or whatever, I think, like you said, having that communication and the expectations like open, yeah. like makes a lot of sense. And also it's kind of about like as far as pricing and stuff goes for the creative world, it's really hard, right? Because in the normal environment, of being an employee or whatever, a lot of times you're charging like hourly, right? You know, like 20 bucks an hour or whatever. But in the creative space, you're, you're anytime you're charging someone hourly, you, you're never incentivized to get better or more efficient. Like, because you're charging yeah. them for your time, you know, like if I can make the same quality, maybe even better video than you, then it, and it takes you a day to make it and edit it and everything, and I can edit it in five hours, yeah. I'm better than you and I can make a better video, but using that, hourly paid model it just doesn't make sense right yeah but everything has to trace back to an hourly model like even though i'm charging a day rate um i still do the math to realize what i'm making per hour yeah so that way i i know how what my value is mm -hmm. you know what i mean like if, totally. I'm, if i'm working for a thousand dollars a day and my hours are eight hours well then my hourly rate's pretty fucking good mm -hmm. if i'm working 16 17 hours a day which is not uncommon in this industry in the video industry yeah uh, well then, you know, I'm making less than $100 an hour. So then my value is totally different. Mm -hmm. um, so I think even though we charge day rates. Um, You're still kind of in the background calculating that hourly. Calculating per hour. Yeah, but maybe not going out front to the client and telling them that's your hourly, but like in the back of your head kind of knowing your hourly or whatever. Well, see, the, for me, it like I said, it all is kind of hourly anyway because any conversation I have with a client is gonna be like, my rate's $1,000 per day uh, for 10 hours. Mm -hmm. So and anything over 10 hours is time and a half. Yeah. So that way they can do the math too. It's like, it's not yeah, that I'm yeah, charging yeah. an hourly rate, but they know that $1,000 a day, 10 hours is what I consider a day. So you can come day. out with your truck, whatever, yeah. all your gear, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Or that's without gear, you said, but that's you, without you know, gear, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that totally makes sense. Cause um, you know, it, this applies to like any creative field. I know a lot of people out there are probably in this world where they probably want to create stuff or they like, you know, aspire to be getting paid to make things or maybe they're an artist and they have no idea how, what to charge. Like my buddy Richard that you met earlier, like he he um, dealt with that a lot because he used to be um, really big in, in art and like making like sculptures and all kinds mm -hmm. of cool shit. And like his friends, um, would do an art show and they'd like severely undercharge and like it's all about perception, right? It's all about like that highest possible value. So like he told his one friend um, he, She was like he was like you need to make your prices way way higher She's doing this gallery show. She'd never sold out a show She'd done some gallery shows, but like made some money Yeah, and he said that she, when she increased the price. She's like dude Richard I'm so scared like no one's gonna buy anything tonight she sold out within like the first hour because the perception of all these buyers there, they were going in wanting to buy an expensive piece of art. Yeah. And when that art on the wall is only $100, they're like, ah, it's kind of like buying, you know, like for example, you're wearing a pair of Yeezys. If you saw like this pair of shoes and you didn't know the name behind it, you might not have that same like perception the first time yeah. you see the shoes. Like the first time someone's like, the 350s have grown on people a lot, I think too, by the way. Yeah, I, like, I have a story behind these shoes. Yeah. But, you know, my, so, I always consider myself a hustler. Like, uh -huh. even though I, I'm doing pretty good, my business is okay. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm good. I don't need to like do like side hustles. Yeah. But flipping shoes is like something that I was like super interested yeah, in trying. Yeah. So this was like the third pair of shoes that I was gonna flip. So I bought them, got them from like the Adidas app or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the like Adidas confirmed app yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Got them from that. I was like within the first like whatever thousand or whatever, and then. 
I was like, all right, I'm gonna, the resale value is gonna be like double what they cost or almost double, I'm gonna resell them. And then Adidas was like, oh, hey, by the way, we're releasing a million more or it's like 500,000 more or whatever, completely crushed the resale value, completely. It was pretty much just retail. Yeah, like you it was retail, for retail or less yeah. than retail. So yeah. I was like, I'm not gonna go through the trouble of trying to sell these for so 10 them. bucks, 20 yeah. bucks. And like that 20 bucks is gonna go towards shipping them to whoever. So yeah. I just, I'm not that big of a, of a douchebag, I promise you. But like, <laughs> Dude, they're like, cool shoes and they're like, super comfy. I'm gonna keep them because I, I'm, I can't sell them. So. At least you bought them in your size too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of people will buy like weird sizes because sometimes they're worth like The more small sometimes. size, yeah. big sizes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did all the research. Yeah, it was a fantasy of mine to be like a, a sneaker flipper. Yeah. But it didn't yeah, you got to be deep in that world. I it think did not too. work out, and you got to take some fat L's. Like you got to, yeah. you got to, you got to eat some shit a little bit. Yeah, which I mean, that kind of segues back to what we were talking exactly. about. Exactly. Like to me, so you know, we talk, we're talking about trying to figure out if you should charge hourly, daily, what that rate should be, mm-hmm. how do you start charging, and all that. And like, if I was in that person's shoes after everything we just said, I would almost be more confused right Mm -hmm. like oh damn now i really don't know what to do like yeah because it is such a difficult conversation so to me the main thing to let those people know is whatever it is whatever you decide on decide make a decision if you if you don't know whether to charge daily hourly or don't know what to charge or anything like that spend the next three days researching reaching out dming people and all that and then on the fourth day you need to fucking start you need to say this is my rate this is what i'm charging and just do it and if it's too less and if it's too little and then if you have to have a difficult conversation with a client um and go up on their rate and maybe you lose that client it's all part of the game, man. Mm-hmm. But you have to get on the fucking field. And yeah. the only way to do that is to make the decision and move. And then from there, you're gonna learn the game more. Yeah, so. and I think also like, it's almost kind of like, to play with the big dogs, you also gotta charge the big dog price. It's kind of like going back to the art thing. Like, if you want your art to be hung in a hotel, they've got an art budget yeah. of like however much money. They're not gonna even, war- they're not even gonna consider like $100 art yeah. or whatever. Like, but they're I feel, looking I, for $5,000 art. I feel like that's a difficult, uh, comparison though because Mm -hmm. like someone can look at like this art piece on the wall like i can look at that and it's going to tell a completely different story to me than it is to you that's true you may look like that at that and be like it's a rainbow of colors eh, um whatever i may look at that and like remember my grandma's painting from 18 years ago you know or whatever and and then like i'm willing then if it speaks volumes to me i'm willing to pay $800 Eight hundred dollars exactly. or whatever. Exactly. Versus in in like the video production world or like being a creative world, um, you have to deliver. There's so many demands. It's not just painting a piece of art and letting it speak to somebody. You got to make sure. Like so, uh, one of our big clients is is a restaurant, and uh, you know their employees aren't supposed to have black shirts as as undershirts to their pol- uniform polos. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, if we show up at a restaurant and sh- we shoot all this B-roll of their employees and every one of them have a black undershirt on, well then we fucked up. Mm-hmm. That has nothing to do with being a creator, being a filmmaker, that's just following the guidelines and the rules of this corporation yeah. to make sure that their brand is protected, right? Mm. So, so there's like, I don't know, I feel like the art thing is a somewhat difficult comparison. To totally. Me, but, but it's knowing that the content that you're producing for your clients meets their guidelines and requirements before it meets yours. Mm. Um, and that goes back to this, you know, the girl like saying, I wanna do cinematic work and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, if you wanna do any work for anyone else, if you want someone to pay you to do work, you have to meet their requirements and their gu- guidelines before yours. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't care how romantic you are about you being the super creative director or whatever, none of that shit really matters um, unless you're meeting the client's guidelines. Yeah. And then once you're meeting those client's guidelines, the client may be like, damn, this guy's doing it in a very creative way. Like he's really nailing it. And and, and then your value goes up, right? Mm-hmm. Based off of their opinion on the work you're producing. Mm-hmm. That totally makes sense. And another thing is like, the hot, the perceived value of what the end product does, right? So if you're shooting a commercial, that might end up leading to millions and dollars of sales for this company. Yeah. Versus if you're shooting a YouTube video that gets same level of production, maybe even a longer video, a longer edit, yeah. but it ends up getting 200 views on this company's YouTube channel. You know, like the perceived value is totally different because in the company's eyes, maybe they're like, damn, we just paid like, you know, a few grand for this video and it didn't perform the way we wanted, yeah. but that's not your fault as a creator, you know? So it's like, it, it's a, it's a hard um, one sometimes. Dude, I'm in that right now. I have a client on a retainer that 
um, they're like social media guy. He's, he's an awesome guy and he's really good at what he does, but it's a smaller company. They have like less than 50 employees in house. Um, so this guy's like their social media director. Also, he client manages one of their distribution centers or whatever, but he also was like, there's some like, I don't know, like federal government guidelines they gotta follow. I forget the name of it, but yeah. it's like some acronym that he, he manages that for them. So he's wearing all these different hats. So it's not that he's a bad social media manager. He's just too bogged down to like really focus. Social media gets put on the back burner. So we're producing these videos with our retainer, excuse me, and, um, and, and a like, retainer for those who aren't li- who don't know, like that means you're basically on like a contract basis to create a certain amount. Yeah, they're paying of videos they're or paying whatever. Us, we have a contract, uh, and they pay us uh, monthly. And we, um, yeah, we just have different clients that are on retainers like that, and it, it all varies based off how much work we're going to be doing, type of videos. If it's a training video, most training videos are going to be ten plus minutes each, you know, for their type of gear. Um, versus if it's just like 60 second social media ads, then we can charge a little less, but, um, yeah. So, so we have them on retainer and, uh, we created all these really good videos for them. And like the social media guy is like so busy doing other shit that the videos aren't performing and they're not being promoted or marketed. Right. Um, which sucks as the guy that's making them, you want them to perform well. And they're good videos. They look so good and like very high energy and like they're, they're really good videos, but, um, yeah, like, so I have a meeting. So we had a six month retainer. That six month is up now. We I have a meeting with the CEO of the company um, because he's essentially asking that question. Like, why why am I paying you this much money if the videos aren't performing? And like, I got to go in there and be like, well, they're not performing because I don't manage your social media account. So I don't, I'm not in charge of the hashtags. I'm not in charge of sending that video through DM to certain people who would probably buy your product. Like. I'm not in charge of any of that. I'm in charge of creating a very good video and mm-hmm. the video is very good. And if it's not being put out right, then you know what am I supposed to do? But see, I even in those meetings, I always put myself in, the, in like his shoes. And if his question is, why am I paying you this? What's, wh- I'm not getting a return. Why should I keep paying you? My honest response is, you shouldn't keep paying us unless your social media manager can focus on social media and promote the videos and collab with us. Like I'll, I'll write the hashtags and send them over and all that stuff. Like if he wants to collab with us on promoting the videos, then you should keep paying us. But there's no reason for you to pay us as much as I want that money. There's no reason for you to pay us if the videos aren't going to get the focus to actually be promoting yeah, your, your I was, product. Exa- I was literally having lunch with my friend earlier. He, he runs um, an agency that's like kind of like a branding agency where they, a lot of times like it's companies that are going through a rebrand, so he'll kind of redo their website, logo, email campaigns, all that kind of stuff. It's actually, I, I can talk about him. He's been on the podcast before. His name's Alan McNair, and he's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, What's his agency's name? His, it's called Orange Identity. Orange, okay. Um, and he was talking about that, where like, you know, there's clients where they'll, they'll take him in, and you know, he's supposed to be responsible for this, and then quickly realizes that really they need all of this, too. Yep. It's like, not only do I need you to come in and shoot pictures for my Instagram, but we don't have captions that are yeah. compelling. We also don't have hashtags that are, we yeah. haven't done any research on what hashtags we should be using. Or we, you know, we, we haven't, we're not doing any sort of commenting back on any of these. On yeah. like, so it's like, it doesn't matter how good the content is. Again, the word content. doesn't matter how good the creative or the, the piece that's supposed to be the main spotlight is. If the like back end and front end planning of yeah. everything you know, it's not kind of non-existent. If it's it not really reaching matter. people, then what? Yeah, what, yeah. what's the point? And that's kind of what like I'm gonna have to tell this guy. Like, you should pay us to keep creating videos for you because we're good at what we do. Mm-hmm. But us being good at what we do doesn't mean that that video is gonna be seen by your audience. And, yeah, or get you new audience members. So is it kind it. of? I mean, because now that you have your own podcast, you're doing like your own marketing for that. You're kind of more in creative control over more things. Yeah. Is, I mean, there's pros and cons to both of that, but now is it making it like more frustrating with working with clients and other on, on other things, or is it making you realize their struggles more and stuff like that? Um, I, I guess I haven't I haven't even thought about that. Like the podcast became like a networking tool for us, but very. But then like the first four episodes, it became like, wow, I'm I'm actually getting way more value out of this than I could ever put into it. Because mm-hmm. um, I'm talking to different startups and entrepreneurs yeah. that all have unique experiences. Um, 
and all have unique ways of going through similar experiences. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like, I quickly realized like this, my podcast is, is way more beneficial for me as a person than it's ever going to be for like an audience. And to, to be frank, like the podcast is like my side side hustle. So mm-hmm. like, I don't like it's, it's a, it's a struggle for me, man, to like market it and promote it and all that. Like, uh, like, you know, this is kind of like one of your main things, you know yeah. what I mean? Like Matt B. Davis, you know, Matt, he's yeah. like, that's all he does. He lives in like the podcasting, creating content world. I'm like, I have my video production company that I manage for corporate clients. I have a film company that we have two feature films on our belt. One that's about to release in February or early March to nice. select theaters. Um, but there's like all the back end with getting that film scene, getting it ready for VOD and like just managing all the logistics behind that film. I have an app that I'm developing that I've been developing for like the last year and a half, almost two years now. Um, managing that and like making sure that my developer is like staying true to what our core idea was, even though it's changed and all that stuff. And then it's like, all right, now I can think about the podcast. Yeah. And like, so like <laughs> posting content and marketing my podcast is so yeah, back on the burner. back burner of, of what but, I do. But that's kind of like the mark of a, kind of a true entrepreneur, you know, because a lot a lot of entrepreneurs, they have multiple streams of income, right? Or they have multiple like irons in the fire. Yeah. Right? You know, and there is benefit of, you know, just focusing in on that one thing, but if that one thing ends up, you know, going to shit one month or whatever, or something bad happens. Like for me, I'm doing a lot of work with like GIF stuff, but yeah. what if, if Giphy goes down for a month, like it did earlier it's this true, year, yeah. like, you know, we're, we're, you know, where are we, you know, or, you know, creators on YouTube, this happened a lot with like, the whole adpocalypse thing yep. where, you know, for a while videos were getting demonetized and before they were used to making 12 grand a month and now their videos are barely making a thousand, you know, it's nothing. like, it's really, really challenging. And that's why, you know, right now too, people are talking about people getting deplatformed, like, you know, Alex Jones getting deplatformed and yeah. it's like- But does anyone know, really mad about that? <laughs> right, no, no, no. <laughs> He exactly. still has his own website. Exactly, he still has his own website. But yeah. but you know, you let's say he uses GoDaddy and Squarespace. You know, That's true. who's to they say can. that Squarespace could say, "Hey, point. we don't want to host," you know, you know, whatever his website is called anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, hmm. or or his hosting company. Hey, we're gonna sell your domain. You know, your contract yeah. is up. We're not gonna renew it. Like yeah. we'll 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 buy it for because they're independent you know, companies too, so they can make the same decision that Facebook and Twitter and all that made. Yeah, yeah. like it's a weird it's a weird time right now and that's why I encourage people to diversify you know like if you're right now I'm like super invested into Instagram for marketing for the podcast but you know I also try to do other places and stuff like that too because if you know Instagram goes down or you know something weird happens where I get doxxed or like you know people start someone starts hating me and telling all their followers to go flag all of my posts and they all get removed or you know any so anything can happen it's yeah. like you got to pre- kind of prepare yourself for the weird worst type of stuff and the best way to do that is to just like diversify and have like multiple areas yeah. that you can kind of focus on well even speaking of like diversifying um on a very micro version of that is like the the debate of should i be building like my brand and my business brand or should i be building my personal brand mm-hmm. you know what i mean and that's why that's something that I've been battling with for the last year is like, I haven't been posting on my RCR page hardly at all, but I've been posting a little more on my uh, personal page Mm -hmm. and all that. But, but what I'm posting on my personal page is more relating to my business now versus like, just here's me with my dogs on the belt line, you know what I mean? So even that's a tough, a tough one, but I'm, I'm pretty bad at social media. Like I'll, I'll go through like a month of like, I'll have the calendar, I have the plan, I have the mm-hmm. post that I want to put up and all that. And then um, I'll go like two, three, four months without like even thinking about it. Yeah. But it's not because I'm not, like I think about it, but it's just, like, it's so easy to put it on the back burner of like totally. everything that I have going on, so. Yeah. I want to talk about your podcast a little more too, because obviously that's kind of what, what mm-hmm. we're here for. <laughs> that's how we got connected. Exactly, yeah. that's how we got connected. Yeah, I think, I th- how did you I think you added me first or maybe I added you I can't even remember but either way we got connected on social media and then ended up uh, I went and did your podcast but your podcast like we said it's changed a lot we kind of talked about what it was in the beginning now it's very different now you're in your studio you kind of have like a more permanent setup kind of like what I'm trying to do here yeah. it's kind of cool our show's kind of evolved at the same exact time yeah it's true um, and, and it's a total like rebrand 
and and you kind of like you said flip the script on kind of how you were treating it yeah. and stuff so now what what was that kind of catalyst that made you like just totally throw everything out and try to do this new thing yeah that's a tough conversation so um we moved into our new office slash studio in june uh and june 2018 and in june we were paying for our new studio and our old space so all during that month i was like thought that i could build out this entire studio in a month and like as soon as july hit we would be able to move in set on it I was wrong, like fucking <laughs> wrong on that. Like, it, it, like we still aren't done building it out, and and it's been you know what six months now. And, yeah. Um. So all That's that how it to, happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. All that to say, like hey, things were taking way longer than I thought, but I had already made it a point to be like, all right, I'm taking a month long break from the podcast, from work, and all that. I'm going to focus on building out our studio. That month long break became a three month break, and I weren't wasn't able to like. Not necessarily focused, but like I, I have like such an obsessive personality. So as soon as I made the decision, like all right, I'm taking a break until the studio is done, even though it was like three months later when I started waking up and be like, all right, this is gonna take longer than I thought. Like I'm gonna have to change my game plan. During that three month break, I um was a I like I forgot about social media. I forgot about the pressure of posting. I forgot about contacting people to be a guest. I forgot about all this stuff, um, and I don't really know why. I think I was just so focused on getting the office done that it that was honestly somewhat relaxing subconsciously. But mm-hmm. I didn't know that that was going to happen. Like this, this three or four month break that I took was really an accident. Yeah. Um, but it ended up working out for the. But better. it ended up working out, and I I was able to think like when I first started the podcast. Like it did change. It went from being on a tailgate to like going in the businesses, and now it's in my studio, and all that stuff. But like that's all like physical location changes and all that. Versus um, when I when I was on this break, I was able to think like the podcast was just already getting repetitive. Like, and I was only like fifteen, sixteen episodes in. It was getting repetitive. Every episode was becoming like the same questions. It was almost like I had a, a script in my head that like. All right. After this question, regardless of their answer, I'm going to ask this question. And yeah. Then, and then, regardless of that answer, I'm going to ask this question, and it became just such a repetitive, business-oriented. You know, what about your marketing plan and all that stuff? And somewhere along this three-month break, I was like, "This is me being fake, mm-hmm. um, not on purpose." But I realized I was like, "This isn't sustainable for me because I'm not getting enough out of it. Like, I'm not. It didn't feel right that mm-hmm. I was that I was taking." kind of this script mindset to it and then um and then it's so I, I thought i was like okay well now i'm gonna i'm gonna move uh into be, you know it's still gonna be business it's still about local entrepreneurs and startups but it's gonna be more about them as individuals and less about like them operating the business that they have now because like you just said any true entrepreneurship they're constantly going to evolve and change do different businesses try different things and all that so i want to figure out what is making the individual tick and not what's making the business that they're operating in right now happening and i think as far as longevity goes that's way more sustainable and it's more real for me and it all boiled down to like i've done so many video series in the past uh that i'll do 20 30 40 episodes and then just stop and it's because uh, like so, for instance, I was like introing the podcast, like on this episode of the Late Night Startup Show, we're talking to, and it's, that's just not me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm a little more chill. I'm mm-hmm. more like, I don't know. Like I, it just felt like. What's I, up, guys? Welcome back yeah. to my channel. Blah blah blah. blah. Yeah, I felt yeah. like I felt like too much of a host, which I, I am the host, but I want me to be the yeah. host, not like the host me to be the host. Yeah, if that makes sense. But you know what's interesting? Like so for me. I think I think Matt would agree with this. Matt B. Davis, we just talked about him. Like, there's this idea of like leveling up and like staying consistent, staying kind of like stagnant with like where you're content with being at, right? Like, gear can happen a lot with this. Like, I've had the same like audio setup yeah. for a while from mm-hmm. the beginning, actually. From the very beginning, this has been my audio setup. It's very minimal, very yeah. cheap, but it gets the job done. Like, it's good enough. But like, once I had this idea of like creating the studio, it was like, oh shit, like you know, leveling up, like thinking about that. And so making bigger decisions, making bigger purchases and things like that, buying this camera, yeah. you know, I'm about to upgrade my audio gear soon, stuff like that. It's it's 
like actually just watching your show and seeing where like how you kind of started even though you wouldn't have started like that without having your video production company being the the, the backbone of that because totally. you've said like you've been on some other podcasts and people have asked you like hey so for people out there that want to have a setup like yours what should they do and you're like don't you don't yeah. don't aspire because you're going to end up spending 70 grand before you even get easy. started yeah. Yeah, like easy like yeah. more you know more than that you know, because you have an actual place, a studio. Yeah. You got three badass cameras. They all cost, you know, 15, 16, whatever grand, brand new. Yeah. You got a person helping you. You got, you know, it's it. The prices just keep racking yeah. up before, before you even get started. When I was going into the locations, I had three people there helping me. Yeah. Like I'm, you know, these are people that I that I work then. with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I pay them day rates. You know what I mean? Like so, it's yeah. Anyone that watches our podcast and is like, oh man, I want to get to that level. I'm like well, you should have started a video production company 10 years ago because I don't have this gear for the podcast. I have it from my company. Like, I haven't bought a single piece of gear for the podcast besides the mics. Yeah, exactly. Like, that was very podcast-specific. Um, other than that, everything else I, I already had. So. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's where people, like, get it twisted a little bit is, like, but, but for me, I was looking at your stuff and I'm like, dang, this guy's a new podcaster. And like, I liked elements of what you were doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and it actually did inspire me in some ways. Like, oh shit, like this is really cool. I like him doing it. I liked seeing him do this. And I think That's we all awesome. kind of have that. We all look at each other. And like, for example, this one guy, Joel Byers, he has a podcast here in Atlanta. Um, it's called Hot Breath. He's a comedian. I know Joel, yeah. yeah. And Joel it is funny because when I first started my podcast, I've actually never met Joel in real life, but we've connected on social media and chatted yeah. a lot. And um, he's going to be on the show eventually at some point soon, hopefully. Um, but he uh, was one of the people that I saw on social media because I was looking up Atlanta podcasts and stuff when I first got started just to see who was in the space, you know, see who my competition was almost. Yeah. And Joel was one of those people. I'm like, damn, this guy's like established. He's got his cool logo. He's got a bunch of episodes. You know, he's got like almost 100 episodes, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And... Um, I think I purposefully didn't follow him on my like podcast Instagram page because I wanted to be able to like follow him later to see like, you know, see what happened when I mm. followed him. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, you know, oh, now I'm a little more established. I follow him. Maybe he notices me. Maybe we share up a conversation gotcha. versus just at the beginning. I don't want to like not embarrass myself, but it's almost like I don't even want to make that connection yet. Yeah. He's already a little bit too out of my league. And the other day he mentioned something to me about like, man, I hope I get to your level one day or something like that. I'm like, dude, like, That's are you crazy. kidding me? Like, you know, and not to, not to, you know, brag on myself, like, oh my God, now I'm way better than Joel. But, but in my mind, I still think that like Joel has been like more established. He's been doing it probably like twice as long as me, blah, blah, blah. And it was so cool for like him to be inspired by me and me at the same time being inspired by him. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's cool how like that can work out. Cause you were even saying like, you know, doing those video intros, it wasn't me, but for me, I was like, I was looking at it as, you know, maybe not, I, I would agree, kind of like the same thing, maybe you're being not yourself a little bit, mm. but I also had to get out of that comfort zone a little bit too with my intros and stuff, because I'm like, you know, now I need to do my intros on video. If I'm gonna do my actual podcast on video, I need to do my intros on video, and maybe if, you know, while I'm at it, I need to put some graphics up too, talking about what I'm talking about, yeah. and make it a little more interesting. Just, le just those little things to level it up. And then those little things go so far they do. as they far do. as perception, dude. Yeah. Like, you know, you know it. Like people, people perceive this show to be way bigger than it is because because there's no gauge on it, right? Like, there's no public figures on like who's listening and who's not. Yeah, it's kind of like you know, with Instagram, you can see exactly how many people are following you. Yeah, people use that as a gauge for how like famous you are. But it all, but it doesn't really gauge your actual impact, you know. Yeah. And that's where like the difference is with like a podcast, because people don't really know. It's almost kind of like, so how many, how many people actually listen to your show? And then they're always like, either surprised or like, they're, you know, it's just, it's just a weird thing. Yeah, it it's is. a very weird thing. It is. It is, and it, it's funny because I look at like, even the video podcast now that we're doing inside our studio, I still look at them like, God, this looks bad. And, like the lighting's not exactly how I want it to be and like this and that and like I would love to put up shit like this behind our set but you know honestly I move that podcast set up all the time because a client come white in wall. and they shoot on the white wall or even the black the wall the black wall the black wall sorry um, yeah and and it's like I you know I got to keep what yeah. is actually making me money 
Exactly. Uh, as a priority. That's actually so. This is this is a in, this is a podcast exclusive. I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast before. Podcast exclusive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a new segment on this podcast. Yeah. Podcast exclusive. Music to transition. Yeah. Into so this. this wall right here. I, a lot of people don't realize this, but so number one, this is not a sign. This is like this one is actually floating. Is this is a physical. My hand can go behind. This it. is a physical sign. This is not a sign. This is like a drop it's shadow printed it. on there. And it's actually you can see there's like a seam right here. Yep. There's two separate sheets. A lot of people. This is my initial concept was I'm gonna put up. I'm gonna sticker bomb this wall because I've always loved stickers. Like I literally have like these stickers of what's on the wall here. But and I was like I'm just gonna buy like. A thousand of them and sticker bomb it. Then once I did the math, I'm like, this is gonna be expensive really fast. And luckily, my friend Justin had reached out to me like around the same time. I was like, hey, if you ever need any like signage stuff like that, I make like stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, let's yeah. make something. So literally, but, but my idea was initially, I was like, I kind of wanted it to be modular. We ended up sticking it to the wall, but you could almost do something like this and come up with some sort of system where it like could it come off because it's one piece. It's like. It's like about this thick. You can yeah. see it like on the wall there, yeah. like where the ending is. You could even make something in your studio where you could almost like just mount it, it yeah. and take it off. But you know, the logistics of that, however, however it shakes yeah. out, but it, it, it's, yeah, I, it would I agree. Be, it would be so much more leveled up if like it was like my main, my main thing. But yeah, yeah, I feel you. It's even like, you know, I just, I, I realized that I needed to like make it sustainable for me mm -hmm. and that's where it's like became really eye-opening and why i honestly am okay with like the way that it's going right now even though i'm not putting out episodes regularly i have no like set schedule um i'm not posting that much on social media and all that um i'm just still so grateful that you know people will i'll dm somebody like hey you want to be on the podcast Get, they go to our page see that we have like 420 subscribers and they're still like yeah would love to do it. Uh, yeah. They're still willing to come in and do it. And then, like, I don't know. To Sometimes me, Sometimes it might be their first podcast, too. It's almost like a little bit, even having a smaller show ask you for the first time might be almost kind of beneficial because yeah. there's a little bit less pressure almost, totally. you know? Like, even though it's, like, high-level production, even though you see, like, you're like, yeah, they have, like, 400 followers. At the end of the day, it's all going to be beneficial. Yeah. I'm a big fan of saying yes to pretty much all opportunities. Sometimes it bites me in the ass, but, like, it it makes sense a lot of times. And what you know? does it what does it take? Like it took me thirty minutes to get here. It's gonna take me four hours to get home, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, but like it doesn't take much time. It doesn't take. Hopefully, like, you're gonna be going opposite of traffic a little yeah, bit. Yeah, maybe. I yeah, two eighty five is gonna suck. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. But uh, but anyway, yeah, it's like yeah, say yes to opportunities like this because uh, it's practice for me. So like honestly, you you talked about like doing things out of your comfort zone and all that stuff my podcast or doing this is out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm way more introverted. Like I don't necessarily, I'm not one for small talk. I hate small talk. If we're on an elevator together and I don't know you, like don't say, oh, nice weather today. I don't give a fuck about your opinion <laughs> on the weather. Like I don't care to hear your small talk or anything like that. Um, and I'm just way more of an introverted person. So it's a lot yeah. for me to have a conversation with someone that I don't really know. And then some of these conversations, I'll be honest, are people that like, you know, they're sitting across from me and I'm like, I, outside of this, I probably would not like this guy <laughs> or, or like, in, but, yeah. but it puts me in a position. It puts me in a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. It puts me in a position to, to be like, to, to like have to adjust or have to like change my mindset or, you know, like, I don't know, like just doing my podcast in and of itself, it's out of my comfort zone. And that's why I'm like, so willing to just regardless of the growth of the followers of the listeners and all that i don't that, i mean obviously the goal was to make it like a sustainable podcast is bringing in some money and all that stuff that, mm -hmm. that's the goal but you know it's been so beneficial for me internally that i'm this is not it's not on my horizon right now is is making it something you know mm -hmm. But either way, people should listen to it because it's really good. Wait until the economy collapses, and then I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to do an advice-driven podcast for all these people who are sucking right now because the economy collapsed. <laughs> but and that's the scary thing, too. Is like I truly believe that the economy is going to see another downfall in the next three years, yeah. um, which is why... We've had it too good for the past, what, 10 too years? Too good, dude. Yeah. Too good. And, like, you know... You, you have someone like Gary V is like, it says the same thing. The economy's going to collapse, and that's when the... We're gonna see who's really talented and all that. I'm like, no, you're gonna see who's, I disagree with that. You're gonna see who is talented, yes, 
but who has been making the right moves and decisions while the economy was good as far as coming up with an extra stream of revenue or or thinking about the collapse or the downfall now and like adjusting and pivoting for that um because if you aren't thinking about those things now during that moment it doesn't people aren't going to listen to how talented you you are they're going to care about what you can provide them to help them get back on top Mm. um talent without proper execution doesn't mean shit in in that scenario Mm -hmm. so with the last time the economy crashed what was your business like at that point uh just starting i mean we like i was so i it's an interesting story for me because i'm a diagnosed type 1 diabetic I was born with type 1 diabetes. It's not mm-hmm. type 2 that you get from being bad and shit. Yeah. habits and all that. Type yeah. 1 you're born with. Um, and up until the Affordable Care Act passed, I had to stay within my corporate 9-to-5 job to have health insurance. Wow. Um, so I wasn't even able to go full, full-time until 2014, January 1, 2014, when Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act went into effect and I couldn't be denied insurance. And as, as soon as huh. that went into effect, I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm, I'm like, I'm out of this corporate job, doing my own thing and all that. But I had already been building my company and my business years prior mm-hmm. to that. Um, all that to say that during that initial downturn, like it, it didn't, it didn't affect. Me. I wasn't big enough. I wasn't making enough yeah. money to like really feel an impact. Yeah, that's I. I'm always weirded because the last time the economy crashed, I wasn't really in the workforce. Like I was, I'm, you know, I'm still young. I'm only 24. Yeah. Like so, I didn't your, really. Your parents felt it. You yeah, my parents felt, felt it for sure. Yeah, but it, it's a weird thing for me because like I'm always I'm fascinated by that idea of the economy crashing, right? Because like. It's almost kind of like the sky is falling mentality, I feel like, for most of it, though. Because it's like if everyone's just talking about how shitty the economy is and everyone starts talking about how no one's spending money and everyone starts talking about how... It's like you create what you talk about. You know what I mean? The media right now talks... You know, there's so much talk about all this, like, racism and all this stuff that, you know, really gets people going. And not to say that it's all fabricated obviously racism exists obviously there's fucked up things happening in the world but like if i'm walking on the street and there's a black dude next to me it's not like i i feel this like inherent tension yeah like like you know like you know it, it, i think a lot of it's like fabricated kind of like and to take it back to the economy thing if everyone's always just talking about how shitty the times are and stuff it's almost like you kind of create what you're talking about. You create, sort of like yeah. you're no speaking one's, into existence. No one's spending money. Small businesses aren't investing back in their, you know, whatever. That you know, I'm I run a social media company, and no one wants to spend money on Facebook ads right now, so I'm fucked. It's like, well, you know, maybe you know, there's obviously some people. There's still ads running right now. You know, there's still things going on. Like, yeah. you know, you just got to figure out how to maybe maybe you've made a fatal error before. Maybe there's like some weird thing that. Maybe you got to take some jobs that aren't just cinematic stuff. Yeah, like, exactly. you know, like there's not going to be as much room for passion projects and yeah. shit. Like you just got to make money, you know? And, and now is the, is the time to be preparing for that. I mean, if there's, if there's anything that I hope came out of the last economic downturn, it was a, the realization to any small business owner um, or, or in, any non fortune 300 or fortune 500 company, right? That it was the realization that, those big players can fuck up and they're going to be taken care of by the government. They're going to be bailed out. They have the ability to go bankrupt and lose everything. And yet there's still such a big company that the government is going to bail them out or like they're going to be okay. Regardless, they have a trillion dollars in assets that they can sell off and be okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that the realization happened that even though the economy collapses because of these big players making the wrong decisions, the people who really, really, really are affected for the short term and the long call are the small business owners mm-hmm. and the individual families and all that. So I, I just hope that there's been some sort of realization of that and it's made people in like mine and your shoes who have podcasts and doing our own thing and all that. Um, it's made people like us want to provide or lean on each other a little more, um, realizing that we don't get that government bill out, mm-hmm. you know, for like sure. When the economy tanks, we it's feast or famine. Um, when the economy tanks on the big guys, it's feast or get government money to feast more. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like, I, I don't know. It just, 
it, it's like I'm trying to be optimistic while like talking about all this negative yeah. shit. But yeah, you got to be realistic. It's kind of like talking about death. It's like it's kind of inevitable. You know, it's yeah. like one of those things going to happen. Of. It's for sure inevitable. Yeah. Inevitable, right? <laughs> yeah. Did you ever like? Because it's interesting being. I, I'm friends with a couple of people who are type one diabetic as well. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting like world when you have to have like you know your standards of like what you have to do to actually just live on a daily basis are different than me or the average person out there. Same with like Richard that you know you met earlier. Like he's got to do a lot of shit just from in his condition like that is very different than the average person yep. just to kind of be alive and pain management and all that type of shit. Like so you know when that when that Affordable Care Act happened like what did that feel like for you? Did you feel did it feel like finally so, uh, being recognized as like a uh, I just, I knew that I could then do my own thing 100%. And like, I don't, uh, like I, as much as like type one diabetes held me back, um, I didn't even think about like that, like what you just said. I didn't even think about it. It was more like, all right, it's not holding me back anymore. Let's go. Like, yeah, That's I don't know. Cool. Like I, it's my, this kind of relates, like my in-laws and my wife always give me shit because like on Christmas morning when I open presents, it's like, I open, I'm like, oh, thanks cool i like it like i don't like it's very hard for me to like pat somebody on the back or like you know give this recognition like i think i'm good at that but as far as like being like super excited super about excited stuff, about yeah. stuff, stuff like that i'm like it's on to the next like work move yeah and, and all that yeah i feel that yeah i think sometimes with like presents and one thing that's weird about christmas for me recently especially like this year you know like with my with my family it's always been like presents are for Christmas, it's like, you know, and not a knock against my family or anything because I'm guilty of it too, but it's like, you know, you buy someone like, you know, a pretty nice gift, but it's nothing like crazy. You know yeah. what I mean? It's nothing like, we just bought you a new car. Yeah. Like, because I, I know some families are like that. Like, they go all out on Christmas. Out, yeah. I kind of want to, like, do that when I'm older. Like, I kind of want to, hopefully, I'll be successful to yeah. the point that I can, you know? But, like, you know, I always, it was always funny because, you know, they're, you always want to look at the people that are doing better off than you. You're never looking at the people who are worse off yeah. than you. You know what I mean? So, of course, there's people out there who would be, you know, ecstatic to receive the gifts that I receive. And I'm not amazing. talking down on anything. I'm super grateful for everything. But, like, for example, this year, like, just, like, this podcast studio. Like, this is, like, what You're gets me going. Like, this, I'm yeah. so stoked. Like, you know, just getting new gear, getting, like, a badass camera. Like, that gets me stoked, you know? But where where does that trace back to? To me, is an interesting point because it's, like, yeah. it's, to me, that traces back to your hard work and the blood, sweat, and tears that it took to get to this point. So you're more excited about, like, your journey finally somewhat paying off uh, and, and starting a new journey, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Like Versus the, just getting a, a gift that is like, I didn't do anything for this, so yeah. thanks. Because like a camera represents like potential, right? Yeah. Like there's, you could just let it sit and collect dust or you could you could make, you know, millions of dollars creating a crazy movie or yeah. you could make really cool videos that compel people to have an emotional attachment. Like you can make people cry, you can yeah. make people laugh. Like there's so much potential in that one little device you yeah. know versus like a christmas present that is you know maybe a cool little gadget or whatever but it's not going to give you that yeah. same like you know yeah. excitement or whatever totally. and, and I, i'm kind of in that same boat where like you get something and you're excited by it but it's like you know yeah how, how excited because yeah, also i think amazon kind of changed the game with like stuff that you want to totally. like i see something that i want and i just buy it just you know what it, i mean yeah. like especially recently Instant with like gear and stuff like that i'm like oh, I need this for the studio yeah. right now. And like, that gives me that pumped. credit card's out before you even realize you pulled it out. Right? Right. That's how it is with me. I'm like half asleep out to buy some new gear. And yeah. I'm like, how did my credit card get in my hand? <laughs> like, it's like <laughs> I almost was sleepwalking to, to get to that credit card. That's hilarious. But I mean, that's another like whole conversation though, is like the, the whole instant gratification thing. Like I've been really trying to not do those things. Yeah. And I think like for people my age and even more so your age like instant gratification is a, is a is a detrimental thing yeah it's like it's bankrupting people it's like putting people in positions where they can't say no and like, yeah, yeah yeah it's a scary real problem in, yeah in like in in younger generations so for sure it's scary yeah one last thing i wanted to ask you about was the college situation because neither i went to college for one year and yeah. then dropped yeah and it wasn't to do anything related to what i'm doing right now but i think that it was a beneficial choice for me. And you, you kind of said the same thing. Like you kind of told your mom, like not going to college. And then it kind of just got like dropped. Yeah. 
And I think there's, I, I definitely know there's younger people listening to this right now, like people in high school. And it's a touchy subject to, to ever give people advice, like don't go to college. Because, um, you know, for my parents, for example, they both went to college. So anytime I talk about it, it's always kind of like, uh, I think, especially my dad has this kind of, um, under it, it almost seems like I have this underlying tone of like condescension towards like a decision that he made and arguably a decision that ended up do, making you know him the person that he is today and then yeah. ultimately our family being in a position that we're in today like you know we're we're, we're well off you yeah. know so it's kind of it, it's kind of like a, a weird thing and my mom's not that way as much like I think she gets that times have changed so much that it it's not the same decision that yeah. it once was but what what's your kind of like current take on that and what kind of like advice i guess would you give people that are kind of maybe they're in college or maybe they're just about to maybe go or whatever yeah um well so so first off if you're in college and don't really know why you're there if you don't know what you want to do what you're majoring and all that leave college immediately because you're wasting money and time um you're not going to to me you're not going to find out what it is you want to do and pursue in life by listening to a college lecture I also understand that I never went to college, mm-hmm. never experienced that, so I have very little right to say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I'm not so naive to where like I don't I don't realize that. But it, to me, it kind of goes. So it, I think the conversation is getting easier because it goes back to what you said earlier about like the economy collapsing. Like if you say something enough, that it's going to become a reality. And I think there's enough conversation now that's constantly being generated about you know, college is a bad move. If, like, don't go to college if unless you're trying to be a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. Like, all these conversations are happening so often that I think it's a great thing that parents are probably more receptive to their kids coming home and being like, look, I don't, I don't, don't want to go to college. Mm-hmm. Versus even five years ago, it was like, if you said that, some parents would be devastated. Yeah. Um, and, like, neither one of my... My dad went to college later in life, like, even after I was out of high school and stuff. He went to online school. But neither of my parents went to college or anything like that. And uh, I had a lot of friends where I grew up, and neither of their parents went to college. I grew up in, in like, not so good part of town and, like, a little more ghetto and stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, most parents had never went to college. And it was kind of like a badge of honor that the parents wanted for their kids to go to college. Like, you would be the first person to get a degree. Totally. And all that. And like, it still is a, that for a lot of people. It still is that for a lot of people. And that's so much pressure to put on a young child who, if you really think about it, they're super young. They haven't been out of your nest yet. Like, they haven't experienced life yet. They haven't experienced real life issues or drama yet. And you're already putting this responsibility of a four-year commitment a huge financial burden whether you're paying for it or not almost if the parent is paying for it it's almost even a bigger burden right Mm -hmm. um and it's all this pressure on this kid who they're a kid they're a child like if your child comes to you and is like look i don't want to go go to college because i don't i don't know why i would go i don't know what i want to do and all that i think you're doing them a disservice if you still demand them to go allow them allow that child to experience a little bit of life like i and still provide some tough love, you know, if they are if they decide not to go to college and they're living in your basement and still going out every Friday and Saturday while working at Wendy's, you know, like, oh, then you need to show up and be like, all right, get your That's shit a good distinction. Get, get the fuck out of my house. It's a very good distinction. But, like, with my mom and my, and my parents, I said I had most conversations with my mom about high school and shit like that. But with, with, with my parents, I was already working at what I wanted to do. They saw mm-hmm. me filming every night, every weekend. They, they, I had already said like in seventh and eighth grade, like this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, and all, so, so like when I said I didn't want to go to college, it wasn't like I was like just sitting back twiddling my thumbs like what the fuck am I going to do then? Yeah. It was like I'm not going to college because I know what I want to do. Mm. Um, and that's unique. To me, that's rare. It is very rare. But I do think that a parent can better serve their child um, by if that child doesn't know what they want to go to school for, doesn't know what they want to study or do in life, to a, at least allow them a year to not have to take on that financial burden, to not have to take on that responsibility that you're putting on them to get that degree as the, your bad, as the parents' badge of honor. Take away all of that pressure and just let them live a little bit. Let them experience things and do things outside of school, outside of their friends. Like, I don't know, I think that's super important. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And, and actually, 
when I dropped out, I made this YouTube video because I was tired of explaining it to people and I didn't, and I, I wanted people to understand kind of like a podcast, like a podcast is a really good form to like explain things, right? Yeah. Like, you know, when like there's some really iconic podcasts where people have gone on to kind of set the record straight where you couldn't really do that in any yeah. other form, you know, like Lance Armstrong going on Joe Rogan's podcast. Like that was like iconic because he was able to, for the first time to kind of get it all Just out talk. there and explain yeah. his side of the story without any kind of media bias, stuff like that. Yep. And like, I think that for me, that YouTube video is literally called why I, Dro- why I'm dropping out of college. And, um, it got way more attention than I expected it to. Um, I think it got like 10,000 views within the first year wow. or something of That's me awesome. posting. And I think it, right now it has like, 30,000 or something crazy. It's still up there if you want to go watch it. It's a little bit cringy now. Um, not really my favorite video yeah. I've ever made, but no no edits, no cuts. Literally just me with my phone camera yeah. sitting on a couch talking. And this but, isn't a, a stab at you, but I, I would be willing to bet that that video is getting more views than you expected simply because of the title. Oh, totally. And people, and it's oh, such that. a conversation for people. It was super clickbaity. And it's funny because if you look at the analytics every year, right around the time when people are applying for colleges or it renewing their semesters or in between semesters, you better believe there's a spike in views and um, comments and people even reaching out to me and finding yeah. me. It's really funny. Well, kind of how we started this whole, whole podcast too is like somewhat towards the beginning was like, the ability and the willingness to be misunderstood. I, totally. I think that goes along with that conversation. Like your parents may threaten to disown you if you don't go I to was school. Pre- I was fully prepared for that. Yeah. I, and, I was very prepared for that. And that's, to me, that's, that's okay. It's your, yeah. it's your life. It's, it's a, it's a tough decision, but you also have to be very, 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 very real with yourself. So like I said, if you're, if you're making a decision to not go to school, but still not pursuing anything or trying to do anything or starting anything like what if you're if you're just still sitting around not doing anything well then you're doing yourself an even bigger disservice Mm -hmm. than your parents forcing you to go yeah and and to be honest i would bet that if you're listening to this podcast right podcast right now and you're kind of having those thoughts you're already kind of the type of person that would maybe benefit from trying something alternative you know because i would say that a lot of people listening to this podcast are people that think differently and and maybe are like a little bit misunderstood maybe yeah. uh, maybe are a little bit weird but i like the weird people you know like it's those such are the a great people i gravitate thing. towards I mean, if you think of like every impactful invention or or study or whatever everyone who started those uh, what it was misunderstood totally at some point and most of them misunderstood for 15 20 years yeah and so they like actually some artists like even they weren't understood until they after they died or whatever you know like van gogh or whatever like you know yeah like they you know it, it's kind of crazy but it all goes along with the story and i think like having a like impactful legacy and like impactful story like you know it makes a lot of sense i'm gonna be ex- i'll be very very excited to be able to like I think my kids one day will be like, yeah, why did you, dropping out of college, it probably wasn't even that hard of a decision to make, but it's like, no, you don't realize, like, that was the counterculture. Like, you know, I I think that the college bubble is going to pop pretty soon. So I think in the future, it's going to be kind of almost harder to explain the idea that it was like counterintuitive or it was weird to post YouTube videos at first or post on social media because it's just become so ingrained. It's the normal thing to do. But yeah, I remember getting comments on Facebook about that video, um, even from some people that I thought were kind of close to me saying like, how dare you uh, even suggest to these highly suggestible young people that like, you shouldn't go to college. I wonder what that age range thing. was He from was the people commenting that stuff. Yeah, it was weird. He was a little bit older than me, a few years older than me. Um, and someone that I looked up to, so it was hurtful to like see that comment from him. But at the same time, like I knew that I was misunderstood and I had a vision for something bigger. Mm-hmm. And at the time I was working for this like network marketing company. So I had like all these grand visions of yeah. where I was going to go with like making money and shit. But like I still ended up making money in that company. I've told this story a lot, but it, that was the catalyst that got me out of my yeah. out of my comfort zone and, and made me into the person today. And, and honestly, a lot of the people I've had as guests on this podcast are people who I've met through that organization. So it was a totally positive nice. thing for me. But I, I it is hard. Like, you know, if you're having that conversation, you don't know what to do. Like you were kind of in that unique position where you did know what you wanted to do and it didn't involve college. Yeah. I think a lot of kids out there are like, I don't know what to do. And college just like seems like the natural route yeah maybe i don't even really know why i'm there but it, like what else am i going to do and what am i going to tell my parents mm-hmm. you know like that's a hard thing but i 
I did go tour uh, Full Sail. I, I, Full Sail like, University, full, yeah. yeah. Full Sail is like a creative film mecca college. I think right? a lot it's of like, people get really amped up because you get a MacBook when you go there too. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, like, oh, I get a MacBook. Oh, they try to sell me on that. So like, I remember going down there. It's like, if I'm going to go to, and this was the conversation I had with myself and, and my mom, I said, if I'm going to go to college, it's going to be a filmmaking centric college. Mm -hmm. And Full Sail was interesting to where it was like, in two years, you get your bachelor degree, or like I know well, a couple of people went to full set. Whatever, it's, yeah, it's, in, it's interesting. My my brother went there, and he's still. Well, I think he finally got it paid off. But anyway, it's um, so expensive. It's so expensive. Fuck. So I went down there, and it was like, was back then it was going to cost like one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for the two years to, for the two years yeah, to go it to sounds school. About right. And like, you get a Mac. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I, I can <laughs> buy a, like a thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. I can buy a Mac for less than one hundred twenty grand. And then, but um, for the kids whose parents are just paying outright for all of it, they, they're like, "Cool, I get a Mac." Yeah, kind of like with kids in college now. It's like, "Oh, cool, my parents are paying for all of it, and I get to live in this dope like dorm with yeah. all my friends and drink Play on the beer weekends." Pong. And yeah, I mean, I just got super disrespectful. Like, I literally, the tour we drove. It was me, my cousin, my brother. We were all filming stuff together prior to that. We all drove down, and uh, I got so disrespectful on that tour. Like, really? Like, not like outwardly like saying shit, but like. You know, they would take us on the bus to the back lot to where this professor was talking about, we have this and this and that, and this is what we do and all that. And I was like, motherfucker, you, why aren't you doing the industry then? Why are you sitting here selling all these kids on paying a hundred grand to go to the school to get knowledge from you who aren't isn't even, even working movies. in the industry, who isn't making movies? You're just teaching a by the book method. And from what I know, being a filmmaker and a creative, by the book eventually doesn't work like you yeah. gotta innovate and do new things and be creative and test the boundaries and push the boundaries yeah. and all that stuff so like you know he would say something then we went in and toured like the editing room or something like that and the like, same thing i was like you're not doing it you're you're trying to teach it by a book that was written years ago and all that stuff but you're not doing it you're not practicing it you're not innovating as rapidly as the industry is innovating but i think it's, so i was like fuck it i ain't going yeah i think a lot of those students though are are basing that going there out of fear and out of that imposter syndrome and out of I I before I even tr before I even try I just want to like know everything and it's kind of that whole idea of like aim 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 and never fire yeah. like you know and and it's that like you as like a person that's you know doing shit you kind of sometimes have to be that ready shoot aim kind of thing like you got to kind of you just got to go do shit well and I, like i know that you know i hate to say it but there's people that uh you know for example i, I started like an internship program and i was getting some applications in for them, these people that were in this like mass communication major and that was actually hilariously the major that i dropped out of mm -hmm. at the college that i was going to and the the portfolios that i was getting back were just like i'm like if you would have made like one like the videos that they were making were just so trash yeah and i'm like i i just from trying shit and trying to make stuff that i like to watch like can make something that's just way better than this and i, I hate trashing on students and so because they're still learning but at the yeah. same time it's like you could tell that the only time they'd ever tried to make a video was for this one project for this one class and they didn't care about what, how it actually yeah. turned out they were just trying to get a grade on okay, the assignment great. yeah totally. and i'm like if this is what your portfolio is, like I just don't want to work with you. Yeah. You know? Well, kind of addressing your metaphor about, you know, aim, shoot, fire, or aim, 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 aim. People get stuck in that aim mode. And I, I guess I just thought about this when you were saying it's like the only way to like fine tune the scope and, and the legitimate aim is to fire. Like you got to fire true. that round down the range and realize that it's three ticks to the left, even though you were aiming at the bullseye. And then you can go back and adjust the scope to aim properly that's you know a really I mean? good metaphor man that that's totally true though you gotta you get you know you gotta pull the trigger at some point and do something that's the only way to and, adjust yeah yeah and if it and if it doesn't work out you gotta adjust yeah. that's the name of the game yeah dude i feel like that's a good way to end the podcast yeah, is man. there any other final message that you want to say i feel like we kind of wrap things up kind of nicely there no nah, yeah we we wrap it up nice i mean just to kind of reiterate just just start doing i know it's cliche but one thing that i always say is like things in, in business or in life that are cliches, even though they sound cheesy and cliche-ish, the only reason that they are cliche is because they're tried and true and they work. You know what I mean? Like Very it, true. It wouldn't be a cliche if it wasn't said so many times and, and it wouldn't be said so many times if it didn't work. So mm -hmm. just start, man, just start doing something, be willing to be misunderstood and uh, make sure you're keeping leverage to say no. Boom.
There we go. Love it, dude. Where can people find your info and your stuff and all that? So on uh, socials, uh, at Randall Blizzard, R-A-N-D-A-L-L, Blizzard, like the snowstorm, um, is my personal account. At RCR Video is my uh, video production account. And at The Late Night Startup is my podcast. <laughs> and Late Night Startup, thelatenightstartup.com. You can go there and find information about my uh, my podcast for anyone that's interested. And uh, yeah, we're constantly looking for new like editors and creators and crew members to work with so dm me if you want to want to come out and hang out on set boom love it dude cool man thanks for being on the show randall and uh we'll see you later everybody boom thank you guys so much for listening make sure you go follow randall and keep up with what he's doing i'll be sure to let you guys know when my episode of his podcast goes live and if you've made it this far that tells me a lot about you mainly it tells me that you're a fan of what i'm doing here And I think that means you'd also enjoy some of the other episodes that I have um, recorded in the past. And first, I think you should go back and listen to episode, I believe it's 55. If you're into that nerdy video stuff we were kind of talking about, um, go check out that episode. It's called Get Paid to Learn with Andrew Winchell. He's also a fellow videographer and we had an amazing conversation all about working with big brands, um, turning from an employee to a freelancer. Um, He's also an eating disorder survivor and um, really we just talked about storytelling and all kinds of video stuff. So if you enjoyed this podcast, I'm sure you would like that episode. We recorded that a while ago, like last year. We're going to be doing a follow-up one pretty soon because um, that was right around the time when he was just starting his freelance business and it's doing really well. So Um, We'll have to give an update. Also, number two, go check out episode 68 called Your Network is Your Net Worth with Brian Garland. That episode, I always say, is probably the most underrated episode of my podcast of all time. It's a really, really great episode. And Brian is just one of the most connected people I know. He's an entrepreneur, he's a salesman, and he just has his fingers in like so many different industries and he knows so many different people. Um, So I really, really encourage you to go check that episode out. Um, he's got tons of friends all over the country. So, um, that's pretty much all I got. Thank you guys so much for listening. The next episode coming up, I have a pretty big guest that I've been trying to get on the podcast since April. Not going to jinx it. Not going to say who it is just yet, just in case something doesn't work out. But, um, I did reach out to him and I finally got a hold of him. So I'm super stoked for that next guest. I think we're going to be recording, um, in just a couple days here in, in the studio. Um, so, so be on the lookout. If you want to um, support the podcast, the best way to do that is to go tell a friend, honestly. Like, you enjoyed this episode, you like what I'm doing here, go tell a friend. Um, It really helps me out. And also, if you're feeling like being awesome, go to iTunes and rate this podcast five stars. It really helps me out, and um, it helps other people uh, discover the podcast through iTunes. And that's also the Apple Podcast app. If you're on an iPhone, synonymous. It's the same thing. And... Last thing, if you want to follow me on social media, you can find me at andrewdeitch.com. You can find all my uh, my handles and accounts and everything there. Um, but that's pretty much all I got. Thank you guys so much for listening. And I will catch you guys in the next one. What does it take? Like, it took me 30 minutes to get here. It's going to take me four hours to get home, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, 